Evangelism is likened to you having a lot of kids. But each time you have a baby, you say, you know, I can produce another one. Let me throw this one away. And then you get a second one, say, you know, it's too much trouble, diapers, nursing, you know, ouch, hurts. Let's just get rid of this one. I'll produce another one. Why? Because I have a womb that can produce a lot. Evangelism without discipleship is doing just that, but with souls, not with bodies. If it's bodies, it'll be criminal, and you'll probably spend the rest of your life in jail for killing your baby. Because uh, you brought a life to the world, and then you took it out. I think there should be some kind of punishment for Christians who, who evangelize people, bring them to a decision for Christ, and then drop them. And they don't follow them up. They don't nurture them. They don't feed them. Um, I know one brother, it was a classic case, who's been doing evangelism for 40 years. And every day he's on the road in one city or the other, leading people to Christ. He would witness to them in parks, and wherever he has a, a, a car, uh, like a station wagon, puts a lot of scripture and tracts, and parks his car someplace and puts a big poster, um, God so loved the world, and people come and talk to him. And not everybody prays with him, but because he's evangelizing so much, he gets hundreds of people to pray with him for salvation. So a number of times I've asked him over the years, I've known him for about 30 years, I've asked him, where are those people? He says, I don't know. God knows. And I say, you should stop evangelizing, brother. You can't keep having more and more babies and you cannot take care of them and you will not you, you would just drop them. Uh, he's not planted one church. He doesn't have any Bible studies going. Occasionally he does. But his mentality is, my gift is evangelism. And I'm thankful to the Lord that there is a man this passionate about the gospel, that he would go around um, faithfully. And I know he suffered persecution, and hardships, and so on. And so I cannot really judge him, but I'm using him as an example of one who misses the point of the Great Commission. The purpose of having babies, when you're thinking about, I want to have a baby, is not just that initially you see a baby and then you drop them. It's to see them to full maturity, correct or not? Maybe you don't know all the implications of it. Some mothers say, oh, I have to clean. But then you're not going to throw that baby because you have to clean their diapers. But it's part of the calling of a mother to have a baby and a father and a mother and a family to nurture that child into full maturity until that child starts reproducing and become a parent whether it's a boy or a girl. So let's read together this verse. Can you all read it behind me? Oh, I need to click it. Thanks for the reminder. This verse says, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, and teaching them to obey everything. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. I want to pick on a few ver words here just to remember and to uh, just emphasize some of the things. You know, I'm always amazed at the Bible, how tight it is. In English, it's a little bit loose because there's a lot of uh, uh, prepositions and so on. In the Greek, it's much tighter. <laughs> but um, every word has a significance. Authority. Authority. What do I want to say about authority? Is that when we go to the world evangelizing and discipling the nations, 
we have the authority of Jesus Christ. And he says he has full authority from heaven and earth. Not only heavenly authority, divine, but also means he's the king of kings, lord of lords, he has authority over all authorities on earth. And so no one, no country, no political system must stop us from what we're doing. We have heavenly authority, we're ambassadors of heaven, and we have every right to go and challenge any authority on earth with the gospel. That's my conviction. Practically, you'll ask me, well, can I do that in Mecca? Can I do that in Saudi Arabia? Can I do That's up to you, how you figure it out between you and God. But I know you must do it. All authority in heaven and earth. Therefore, because of my authority, you're gonna go. Now when I know I have the authority of heaven, I know that heaven is with me. And he ends this verse by saying, and I will be with you. So when you go to evangelize, to disciple, you know you have the authority, but also the presence of the Holy Spirit with you. And Jesus told us that many times. When you stand before authorities, don't worry what you say. Why? Because my Father will tell you, give you the words. And I've experienced it in my life. When I've been interrogated by secret police, when I have crossed borders illegally, legally, illegally, when I have <laughs> printed the Arabic Bible in Egypt illegally, legally, which means I found a way to do it. <laughs> and um, it's just amazing how God gave me the right words to say when I could have tripped myself and been in jail for years. And God saved me from that. So when we have God's authority, we have nothing to fear. Nothing to fear. And also we know we have success. Because that's his business. And he's my boss. And he knows what he's doing. He knows the strategy. He is calling me to do a task. And as long as I'm aligned with him and with his purpose, and I have faith in my heart, I will succeed in whatever I do. Everyone that God called in the Bible, the stories of the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, they embarked on impossible tasks. And each one of them said, I cannot do this job. Send somebody else, Moses said. Gideon said, why me? Isaiah said, I cannot. Jeremiah says, I cannot. And then God uses a little David to fell the giant. So we have enough stories in the Bible to tell us with his authority, with his power, we are invincible. He said to us, without me you can do nothing. But with me, there's nothing you cannot do. Praise God. That's the authority element of it. Therefore, based on this truth, go and do what? Make disciples. Disciples. What is disciples? Let us not think of anybody we are discipling as our disciples. We make disciples for Jesus. And when you are discipling someone, you're basically walking the path behind Jesus, following Jesus with that person. So you are also a disciple. You are at a different level, but you're still being a disciple. You're bringing someone along with you. And I have the example of the, um, Jesus says, my yoke is easy. Does anybody know what a yoke is? Who does not? So I can explain it. Uh, I think you don't really know what a yoke is. <laughs> what is a yoke? Imagine two animals, a bull and a calf. Usually a trained, trained ox and an untrained ox. They go together. Because if you have both strong, trained ones, each one will go in a different direction. 
and the yoke links them together so they can go in straight path. When you go to the farm, you see the furrows, they are very straight, straight, straight. And the weight is on the stronger one. And the other one is being trained to learn to stay straight. And then when he's, uh, he's ready, he becomes the main and they tra he trains someone else. And Jesus says, my yoke is easy. It means come alongside me and I will carry your burdens. Come to me, all you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He will take all the burdens and you just go along. The same image is true of us when we are discipling someone. We're coming alongside them, or they're coming alongside us in following Jesus. Baptizing is an important word because it's not only a reference to the act of baptism, but it actually means to give them two things. One is death to self and ident a new identity in Christ. Baptismo in, in Greek means the die, D-Y-E. Interestingly, in English, it's close to the word die, D-I-E, and both are true. To die to self, but also to die yourself with a new color. The dye is something like you have a white uh, top there. If it gets so soiled, you cannot wash it anymore. Usually you just throw it away or give it to charity. But my mother used to not do that. We didn't have enough money to buy new clothes. So she would buy a dye, it's always in the home, put a little powder in the water, and it's a different color, and dip that thing, keep it overnight, and next day it's blue instead of white, or, or green, or black, or red, whatever the dye is. That is baptismo. It means dipping in the dye and rising in the newness of life. That's what Romans 6 talks about. It says we are crucified with Christ and then we're buried with him. We bury our sin, our old self, and then we rise in the newness of life in the new dye, new color, which is Christ's color. So that's what baptism is. It means signifies the evangelism aspect of this great commission. Then what is really discipleship? It's teaching, teaching them. And let me explain to you that no one can be discipled against their will. So the one you're discipling needs to know that you are actually discipling them. You're helping them. And they need to submit to that discipleship process. They need that humility to say, I am willing to learn, I want to learn. There are many dis who are discipling very stubborn people and it doesn't work. You can disciple them for a year, two, 10 years, and there's no growth. Why? because they're resisting discipleship. So right from the beginning, there needs to be an agreement, and not just, let's just sneak in discipleship. You cannot sneak it in. No one can actually. And God created us with a will, a strong will. Each one of us has a strong will. Who doesn't? Who has a strong will? Let me see. Yeah. And God gave you that strong will. Now you can misuse it, by being too stubborn to do the right thing, uh, but you can also use it to be stubborn enough to do the right thing. And finally, teaching them all that I have commanded you. When we disciple, I've had people tell me that they're discipling someone. So I said, how do you do it? So we meet once a week for an hour, and we start from Genesis, and we keep going. I don't think this discipleship. This is a Bible study, and it's very good, and it's important to study the Bible. But if you were to study a chapter a week, how long would it take you to read through the Bible once? Any guesses? Give me a guess. Four years? Four years? Twenty-three years. Why? Divide 1,189 chapters by 52, 
you'll come up with 23 point something. You want to wait that long for them to read the Bible once and they'll forget it by the time the, the second year comes, they forgot what they've studied. This is not discipleship. It's good to have deep study of a verse, a chapter, and so on. But discipleship addresses issues of life, teaching the Christian lifestyle, uh, the, uh, how to uh, wake up in the morning, what to do in the morning, how to pray. Especially Muslims who are used to memorize prayers, many of them have very weak prayer life because they don't know how to pray. You haven't taught them how to pray. I give them sample prayers from the Psalms, from the Bible, but also sometimes I write the prayers for them. One woman called me from Saudi Arabia and says, there's a woman I'm witnessing to and I want to pray for her, but I don't know what to say. I said, tell me the story and she told me her situation and I told her, I will send you a prayer. So I wrote it, I spent an hour typing a prayer. I, it's filled with scripture, took verses here and there, put them together and uh, and I sent it to her, but I told her, don't pray it by rote, like there's magic. Pray it thoughtfully and from your heart. And it worked. There was a healing that happened after that prayer. So teaching them all, it means we have to go through the issues, things they're struggling with, how to deal with their family, how to deal with persecution. And we have in the Cubs to Lions program, we have brochures on the table there. Uh, we have a whole course, a curriculum to disciple the, uh, the converts. Uh, we have one coming up in July, and I hope Alex will come to that. Uh, we have a, a, a conference for Saudis only, and then for everybody else following that. You attended one of these, right? And uh, several people who were here yesterday on the stage have attended those Cups Alliance. And it's life transforming because in one week they get kind of a, not everything, not the full counsel of God, but they get it in capsule form in an organized way, in a structured way, so they know what a Christian life looks like. And now they can go back and live it, live it out. And we have the curriculum uh, that we give them, it's all printed. And some of them have made Bible studies. If they come from one city, we organize them together and they continue to stay together and go back from the beginning of the book and study it. it. Takes a year or two to go through it and we just give it intensely in one week. So if you know any converts, send them to us. For, uh, there's one in July in Colorado and in August in Canada and uh, in September in Beirut, Lebanon. Today I'm leaving for Lebanon to do the Engaging Islam course. I'd love to see some of you come to that in Boulder. How many of you have had Engaging Islam training? Where did you have it? In Grand Rapids. In Grand Rapids. You came to Dearborn a few years ago. And, uh, and there are others and so on. So we have training programs because we're serious about discipleship. We're serious about evangelism. Now let's move to the next one. Um, there are three reasons here. Uh, discipleship is a commitment to see the believers go through these three stages. The first one is survival. A baby cannot survive without immediate nurture. Oh, I need someone to help me with this. <laughs> Why not give this to you? <laughs> uh, uh, survival. We have to think first about their survival. Why do I say that? Because 80% of converts from Islam don't make it through first, second, third year. Some of them last longer, some of them shorter. But it's like a revolving door. There's another slide on that, but I think I should say it now too. It's like a revolving door, come in, come out. And there are many reasons for that. I'm writing a book on discipleship and I have several chapters on this particular issue. Why do 
converts come excited, and many of them have amazing testimonies, how God has moved in their lives. Uh, dreams, visions, miraculous things happen to them, but a year, two, three years later, they're no longer in the church, they're no longer reading the Bible, they don't call themselves Christian anymore. Some of them return to Islam, but most of them don't. Just leave religion altogether. I know a woman I've worked with for years and years, and after 10 years, she now calls herself an atheist. So after learning a lot, going through Cups Alliance twice, and going through training, through, and finally, because the situation in her life was difficult and she couldn't handle it, and she blamed God for her problems. And so there's a lot of issues. And Satan, mind you, he's there, trying to rip these people to pieces, and in, in the words of the Bible, to devour. He's a like a lion, roaring, to devour uh, even the, the believers, even those who are the elect. So the survival is important. In order for this person to survive, they need full attention in the beginning, just like the mother gives her baby full attention. When you had your baby, um, what's your name? Karen. Karen? Tara. When you had the baby, how much time did you spend with the baby the first few days? 24 hours? <laughs> How about the next few months? Until the baby is able to just start walking, you're basically holding the baby most of the time. Even at night, ah, you're going to get up and, and uh, you know, we had our baby sleep between us, <laughs> four children. Uh, I know what it means to take care of babies. My, ma my wife knows more, but I also know. <laughs> I was part of it as well. So, the same thing. Many times we want to save people, but we don't want to touch them with a 10-foot pole. We don't want to be involved in their lives. We don't want the trouble. We don't want the diapers. We don't want the, the whining. We don't want the crying. We don't want the complaining. They're full of it. Literally. How many diapers do you change a day of the baby? Eight, ten times? The same thing with new believers. You have to know what you're getting yourself into. Discipleship is not just giving them Jesus. Now they're saved. Let's go to someone else. So I'm giving you bad news that the ministry is not that clean. It's not that easy. There's heartaches. I've been hurt by people I've been discipling. They have bad-mouthed me. They have spoken ill of me. Even though I have given them and given them and given them and given them, they want more and more and more, and they don't appreciate it, and they don't say thank you, and then they say, he didn't give me enough. So you got to bear that. And some of those people, after years, have come around and said, I apologize, I had a bad attitude, I was immature, and now they have come around. They would not come around if you're not sticking with them, if you start judging them or saying, I don't want to have anything to do with you, you are so ungrateful, and so on. You got to take care of the baby, they'll cry, they will bite you, they'll do all kinds of things that you do not want them to do but they do it because they're babies. So we need to go through that survival mode. But we cannot have this baby continue to do this when they're 20 years old. So we need to have a shift from survival to thriving. We need to see them thrive. Thrive, becoming independent, feeding themselves, and many missionaries are guilty of not moving and wanting them to be independent because you want them to depend on you so much. You keep giving them money, you keep helping them, you keep, you know, always over them, like overprotective, and they never grow up because they enjoy the comfort of dependence. And you enjoy the comfort of somebody depending on you, even though you don't like it, you complain and so on. So we need to transition people from dependence to independence 
and then finally to reproduction. Do you have any kids that are married now? Yeah, see, you went through the three stages, from survival to thriving to now reproducing. That analogy of childbirth and child care and rearing children uh, to maturity is the same spiritually. A lot of physical uh, principles we, we, we learn. Uh, how do you like this? Are you learning something from it? Are you mad at me for giving you a difficult job? It's really a difficult job. I have so many people I'm discipling and almost none of them give me a lot of joy. <laughs> but, the, <laughs> but, but the joy is that I see growth, sometimes very slow, and sometimes I see them thrive. Some of them are now in full-time ministry. There's still some immaturity there, but I'm always guarding and watching to see them thrive and leave them alone to, to make mistakes and learn from their own mistakes and so on. So the same analogy, you have to do that with your children. You let them make their own mistakes as well and grow up. So these are the three stages of discipling, survival, thriving, and reproducing. Say it with me, survival, thriving, and reproducing. Survive, thrive, reproduce. Survive, thrive, reproduce. This is the revolving door slide I, I promised you, 80%. Could be more, could be less, I don't know. I hope it's 1%, I hope it's 0%. Within one to three years, 80% of converts are gone. I remember a time in 1994, I got a call from South Lebanon. I was in Boulder, Colorado at my office. It says, come, we need you, we need you. I said, what? said, the Lord opened up the South like crazy. They're inviting us to speak in, in, in uh, mosques and, and in uh, uh, many uh, you know, social venues and so on. I said, well, what's going on? I don't know, it's happened. So it's a long story how it happened, but it did happen. And South, Africa, uh, South Lebanon, which is a Shiite region, had been devastated in the war from 75 to 91, 15, 16 year war in Lebanon. And all the Christians had evacuated their homes, almost all, and went to the north. And after the war ended in 91, and in 94, I got this call. So I bought my ticket for me and my family, and we flew to Lebanon, and we went to the south, and we began to go door to door with about 200 evangelists, village by village by village by village by village by village. And it was so ripe, the harvest was so ripe, Maybe you will not believe me. I don't even believe myself. It's incredible. It's unbelievable. One time I was invited to debate an imam at a mosque. And so I went there and he didn't show up. The imam didn't show up. So I was a solo preacher. There were about 600 people there. I shared the gospel with them and the, the the head of the uh, mosque trustees stood up and he said, we are so thankful that the Christians have returned to South Lebanon because when the Christians left, you left us, uh, uh, we destroyed ourselves. But now that you have come, it's a sign of rebirth and growth and so on. What in the world? What are you talking about? Yeah, that's what he said. And so we began to go door to door, and there's no less than 50 people, that's an average per village, that, that who gave their life to Christ. So thousands of Muslims heard the gospel, responded in the sinner's prayer, and so on. So one day, the man who was responsible for this whole uh, operation in the South, I was driving with him to Beirut, and uh, he was driving, and I was sitting next to him. We weren't for, uh, for something we need to do. And I said, you know, what are you going to do with all these people? 
He says, nothing. I said, what do you mean nothing? All these people, we got to start churches, we're going to start Bible studies, home fellowship. He said, no. I said, why? He said, we want a spontaneous movement of the Holy Spirit. Wow, how wonderful. Those words are so beautiful. <laughs> spontaneous movement of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. I said, what does spontaneous mean? There's nothing spontaneous in evangelism and discipleship. You have to work at it. You have to go preach the gospel. Paul did not spontaneously see uh, uh, the church established in the Middle East and uh, in Europe. He worked hard at it. He says how hard he went. Sometimes he didn't sleep or eat. And he was agonizing in prayer. And he was preaching the gospel. And he was beaten for it and jailed for it. But he believes in that. I almost strangled this guy, but I said, if I do, I'll, uh, you know, we'll have an accident, I'll go too. I said, you cannot do that. And I was there only for the summer, and I was going to go back to the States. And right now, thankfully, there's still some remnants of believers. But a few years after that, and that openness was from 94 to 98, and then the door shut. Four years of openness. And we had so many thousands of people receive Christ. We could have had churches transform the whole South from that opening, openness time. And then we go there and there's nobody. There's no meetings. How do you meet them? Where do you see them? Where do you find them? You walk in the streets, they're not there. That's the problem I have with the inside of movement. One problem is that they want them to merge in the community and you cannot separate them. You don't know who they are. And so, I don't know, maybe there's still some faithfuls there, but we don't see churches. We don't see anything. And a few years ago, uh, Pastor Muhammad, who was living in Beirut, got called to go and start a church there. So we have now in the city of Tyre a thriving church among the Shiites and a center with a whole block of buildings that we have rented and we bought some parts of those buildings. And we have an amazing ministry there. I showed you one slide last night, yesterday, from that area. And we have hundreds of people coming to the Lord. Syrians, Lebanese, Shiites, Hezbollah leaders. One Hezbollah top leader is, is a believer now, but he's in hiding because they want to kill him. But, uh, but we're, we're, we're okay. We haven't been killed yet. And um, I'll be going in the next two weeks there too. So without discipleship, there's, you're bearing children, throwing them away. So now one element of discipleship is social. It's not all about spiritual. Somebody hears about Jesus. They know now that Jesus is the Savior, and without Jesus Christ, they cannot be saved. You need to give them an opportunity not only to leave Islam, but also to cleave. Cleave, just, I thought it was nice, leave and cleave. But the whole idea is to belong to a community of believers. Many leave without a social substitute. We are social animals. We are social human beings. We need fellowship. We need people. We need a new family. Several of the believers, you probably heard them here, they call me Baba. Why? They need a Baba in their lives. They need a daddy. If I show you on my WhatsApp, I have a lot of daddy, daddy, Baba, Baba, daddy, daddy, hearts and hearts and all that. And I love it. And I, I just enjoy that. It, ha it comes with responsibility. Yes. It's not like, oh, I'm Baba and leave me alone. One person said, you're my Baba, you're not paying for my tuition. <laughs> okay, well, is that why you want me to be Baba? <laughs> Some of them do that. But not all. Some of them are sincere. And you know, it's, it's a process. I can't tell you everything about it today, but just get the gist of it. 
Discipleship is active involvement in the lives of your children. And we need, before they receive Christ, we need to give them a hope that if they leave, they can't leave. And we will give them an opportunity to be part of our family, part of our church, part of our social group in the church, whether it's a Sunday school, a potluck uh, group, a club, whatever it is. But we need to incorporate them socially, not just spiritually. And sometimes we judge them for needing us. No. There are testimonies we heard yesterday, pretty much all of them have had to sacrifice their families. Some in America don't want to have anything to do with their parents, but that's not how we grow up in the Middle East. We need our parents. We cling to them. Some men don't leave the house until they're married, even if they're 40 years old. They're still with a father and mother. Same with women. It's not a done thing that you, you know, you're now 18, get out. We don't do that in the Middle East. We actually tell them, don't get out. Please stay here <laughs> as long as you want. I think you got the point. Now we go to scripture. John 21. There's a beautiful, intimate story between uh, an interaction between Jesus and Peter. It's all about love. And Peter loves Jesus. You know, he was so zealous that he said, no, I won't let anybody kill you. Ah, they, they not on my dead body. <laughs> and I'll never leave you. <laughs> well, he denied him. Of course, he's human. He fell to fear and uh, lied that he knows Jesus and so on. But he cried bitterly and repented from that. Later on, when he saw Jesus, resurrected Jesus, and then when he was filled with the Holy Spirit, he was unstoppable, unstoppable, invincible. The same guy who was a chicken when he saw Jesus suffer, I think any one of us would be chickens in that moment. He stood before authority and says, no way will I obey you above God. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me through Jesus Christ, and you cannot stop me. Because they warned him, they beat him up. They said, don't you mention Jesus again. And what did he do? He went right back to the temple. He was arrested again. And they couldn't do anything to him because of the crowds. They were afraid of a, of, of a revolt against them. And he went back to the prayer meeting and from there, unstoppable Peter. And then at the very end, this is probably the last encounter with Jesus before he ascended to heaven. And Jesus said, do you love me? Why would you ask me this question? Why? Are you doubting me? Well, I can imagine Peter putting his head down in shame and saying, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Why are you asking me? You know I love you. He didn't say, I love you. Yes, I love you. He said, you know. Why are you asking me this question? <laughs> Jesus used the word agape. Do you agape me? And Peter did not dare say, yes, I agape you. He said, I phileo. Phileo is a lower level of love, which is a friendship love. Sometimes in the Bible, the word phileo is translated friends, dear friends, instead of beloved, because the original, the King James is beloved, which is accurate. But the truth is beloved friend, not just uh, beloved or just friend. So it's the love between friends. It's kind of lower level love. It's not as strong, intimate as 
the agape. Second time Jesus asked him, agape me, and, and Peter says, I phileo. He would not say agape. Third time, do you phileo me? Jesus even lowered it down. He says, okay, well, even that, at that level, do you really love me? And Peter said, yes, I phileo. He did not dare say agape. And each time, Peter affirmed Jesus of his love, Jesus said to him, disciple my babies, feed my lambs, shepherd my sheep, and feed my sheep. That's the order of the verses in the Greek. Feed my lambs, shepherd, take care of my sheep, now they're mature, and continue to feed them as sheep. So every word in the Greek has a very important significance. This cannot, in the English language, be captured because they use love, 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 love. But it's agape, phileo, agape, phileo, phileo, phileo. And then even in the Greek, it changes the word about sheep from uh, bosco, armion, arnion, to uh, poimeno, which is sheep, and then bosco again. So, um, we don't have time to exegete more, but you get the point? You get it? On the heart of Jesus is to tell Peter, don't leave these disciples alone. Shepherd them. And we know that Peter and John and James were given special attention by Jesus to prepare them to care for the other disciples who were not as well known, as well spoken. We don't know much about the rest of them. We know their names. But they took care of the disciples, but also they took care of all those hundreds and thousands when Peter stood up and 3,000 received Christ. And then the next day, 5,000. The numbers grew to 5,000. And every day the Lord was adding those who were being saved. And so the disciples were given a mandate to care for those people. So um, I didn't comment on this verse. John 15, 16 says, you didn't choose me. I chose you to send you to bear, not only bear fruit, but fruit that will last. The last thing is the discipleship element. 2 Timothy 2, 1 to 2 says, you my son, notice that he calls Timothy his son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ and the things you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. So there's the training element. Training, 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 training. Next generation, the next generation, next generation. You train one generation and then they train the next and they train the next. One of my biggest joys on this trip to Lebanon, I'm going today, I'll arrive tomorrow afternoon, evening, straight from the airport, I'm going to a meeting. <laughs> Don't have time to go shower. <laughs> I'm going to a meeting. And next day, Monday morning, we start a two-week training course. I have trained 15 trainers. So I'll be teaching only five sessions in two weeks. And the Lebanese and Iraqis and Syrians that have come to Christ and been discipled by us and trained are now taking the burden of training the others. We have almost a hundred people coming, maybe more by the time we get there, and they will be taught by the nationals. The same course that I wrote, they learned it, and I, tr I coached them in how to teach it, and they taught it last year. Only seven last year taught it. Now we doubled the number of teachers. This is the model of the Bible. 
You don't have to teach everything. And many of them, oh, you want to hear you? I said, no, I want to hear you. I'll sit in the back and I'll critique you. Last time, seven people, I had a pad in my hand, I want to critique them. I couldn't critique them. I said, they did a better job than I did. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Student can be better than their teacher. In my case, yes. And so here we have um, the generational legacy from Paul to Timothy to reliable people to others who are qualified to teach. Purpose of discipleship is to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ is not only individual. Some people don't bring their disciple to church. Wrong. You need to involve them in the whole body of Christ. The church is what Jesus wants to build. And Paul emphasized that because he understood it. So that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach the unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, attaining and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So our goal is to uh, disciple little Christ so they become like Christ. Relational. Discipleship is relational. It's involvement lives. He's, he called Timothy my true son in the faith. And Galatians, my dear children, my beloved children. Philippians, I thank my God every time I remember you. It's amazing that Paul's remembered everybody in all of these towns that he planted churches and prayed for them, thanked God for them, continued to write them and visit them and so on. So we are not going to just work one time with this person and drop them, go to the next. We need to stick with them, persevere. We start the discipleship right away. In fact, evangelism is part of discipleship. You start discipling people even before you lead them to Christ. Because discipleship is modeling their lives after yours. Paul said, be imitators of me as I imitate Christ. Help them with their issues and so on. With the last few minutes, this, one, this uh, slide uh, Mark addressed very well about re renouncing the curses and so on, so I'll skip that. And then, um, I, uh, you know, teaching them devotions, tithing, um, conflict resolution, uh, how to witness to their families and so on. But now I want to end with these pictures. These pictures are from Calgary, uh, Canada, when we had our discipleship class. There are 22 nationalities in this. Syria, Iraq, Egypt, Iran on the bottom right. Syria, Iraq, Egypt, Iran, Sudan, Sudan, uh, Palestine, Somalia, Syria, Kuwait up there, Afghanistan, one Indian, one and whatever, you know. 22 countries. I don't know how many people are there, but 22 nations. And this is some of the things that we did. First of all, we teach them in classroom. We put them in groups so they can learn and study on their own. They just follow the curriculum and they teach it. They learn it together without a teacher from us. They teach it to each other. Then, this is a, it's not very clear, but people are on their knees committing their lives to Christ. Some of them have never made this commitment. They've never prayed the sinner's prayer. Some of them have been baptized. One woman here from Egypt said, I was baptized 20 years ago, but I never heard about salvation. She went to church and she goes to Bible studies, but she never heard the full story of how to be saved. She said, today I'm born again. I've been a Christian 20 years, but today I'm born again. So we do that every Cups Alliance. And there's not been one time where at least one or two or three or four or five. Last year we had 20 people 
this is three years ago, but last year we had 53 people. Out of them, 20 people gave their lives to Christ for the first time. So it's important to give them the invitation to receive Christ. Here's one Afghan guy. He lives in Calgary. And that lady there, the Palestinian woman, they met at this meeting. And last September, I married them to each other. They're now husband and wife. We've done this to several cubs. Cubs meaning baby lions, who became lions. And they are following the Lord. Here's a guy from Sudan. Here's a Syrian couple washing his wife's feet. Don't think this is nothing. This is significant. In Saudi Arabia, would you have a, would you wash your wife's feet? No way, Jose. No way, it would never happen. And he said to me, can I wash my wife's feet? I said, by all means, go do it, and I'll take a picture of it. <laughs> and uh, here he is when he was receiving Christ. And here's a, a, a prominent leader, a businessman from Ku uh, Kuwait, who's now in Vancouver. He's washing his wife's feet. They have a ministry, very mature Christians. But they came and they said, I have never learned the things that I learned this week. I've never. It's all new to me. Because evangelism and discipleship is missing in the church. We think evangelism, when we say, we we'll talk about God. A lot of people say, I talk about God. Or I invite people to church. Have you evangelized them? Have you given them the good news? Do they understand that they're going to hell without Jesus Christ? Do they know how to be saved? We've got to do that. Then we dance. We have a celebration. I know how to dance. We go on picnics. They receive a certificate. And that's the last slide because my time is really up. Be a model means model the Christian life and walk with them, mentor them, and persevere. Continue. I pray that you've learned something today about discipleship. Let's pray. Let's pause and you talk to God about what you've learned today. And I'll represent you with a short prayer. Lord God, we thank you that uh, discipleship is on your heart. And I pray that you'll impart that passion in our hearts. And help us, Lord, to learn from these principles and other things we learn. Let us teach us to be students, disciples of you, that we will learn from you how to disciple the nations. And even discipling one person, Lord, could bear fruit in their own country and around the world, like Barnabas discipled Paul and he became a world Christian. Thank you, Lord, for giving us this time together. Pray for the continuation of this conference, that you'll bless every moment until we all leave, and that we will not forget and leave behind the things we've learned here, but that we'll put them to practice so that your message of salvation would uh, go to the uttermost parts of the world, and many will be discipled and equipped and uh, lead many, many others. In Jesus' name, amen.